A year six teacher gave her students a writing exercise. Finish the phrase, I wish dot dot dot. Now she expected to receive answers like, I wish I had a new bike. I wish I had a dog. I wish I had a mobile phone. I wish I could go to Disneyland. But what the teacher received were honest yet troubling answers. I wish my parents wouldn't fight. I wish my mother did not have a boyfriend. I wish I could get good marks so my dad would like me. I wish I had an M1 rifle so I could shoot the people who are mean to me. The teacher was taken back. Such alarming answers, such reflections on society. It raises the question, what is going on with parents? When children are feeling insecure, when, when, when children are, are, are feeling lost in their life, what has happened with parents? What is happening in homes? I fear that what this teacher experienced is not an isolated experience. There are two ways to approach the issue of what's going on in homes. We can approach it from the side of do's, that's positive. We can approach it from the side of don'ts, that's negative. And we need both. In parenting, in grandparenting, there definitely are some do's, some things we should be doing. And there are some don'ts, some things we ought not to be doing. In the next two weeks, we're going to look at the parenting of Isaac and Rebecca. And we're going to draw from them don'ts in this session, and next week, some do's. So we'll start with the negative, and then we'll move to the positive. Warren Wiersbe notes this about Isaac. Apart from being the son of a famous father, Abraham, and the father of a famous son, Jacob, who would be renamed Israel, almost nothing is known about Isaac. And that probably is because there is little extraordinary about him. Isaac, for the most part, is not a good role model. In Genesis 25, verse 19, we have the genealogy of Isaac. Now don't blink, you'll miss it. It's so short. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. That's it. That's all there is to tell about Isaac. Rather unremarkable. Obviously, parenting and grandparenting begins with a birth. And in the case of Isaac and Rebecca, the birth was extra special. It was doubly special. We read on in Genesis 25, verse 20. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as his wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red, all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them, and the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. I want to go back through these verses and draw out some, some details from them. Verses 20 and 21. We see that 
Isaac and Rebecca have tried for 20 years to have a child. The clock is ticking in the same way that the clock was ticking for Abraham and for Sarah. And Isaac is wondering, are we going to have a child? Where is the promise that God gave to us? We are supposed to have a large family. The question about when are these things going to happen, or why aren't they happening, is a question that we've heard already in the book of Genesis. It's a question that came to the forefront on more than one occasion with Abraham and Sarah. And it is a lesson for all of us to learn. God is never in a hurry. He's not in a hurry. God's timing is always perfect. He is always on time, but his time isn't necessarily our time. In fact, it's frequently not our time. And this is the way that he tests our faith. He puts us in the waiting room. Will we believe him enough, strongly enough, that we will be patient even though the promised fulfillment, from our perspective, is slow in coming? There was an occasion when one of our daughters fell ill and we needed emergency help. We rang triple zero and we waited for the ambulance to arrive. And we looked at each other, Sue and me, and, and where is the ambulance? Why is it taking so long? It seemed like forever. At last, when the ambos arrived, they didn't jump out of the, the, the vehicle in a hurry and run up to the door. No, they stepped out and they... They, they took their time getting their equipment, and then they walked up to the door. And we're watching all of this, and we are feeling frustrated. We are in a hurry, and they are not. Don't they know that we desperately need them to attend to our daughter? It's an emergency. Well, that's the way it felt to us. In reflection, after the fact, the ambulance officers were consummate professionals. They knew what they were doing and, and, and they did it in the right way. I cannot fault them. But at that moment, when our emotions were heightened, it was so hard for us to wait. And it is the same way with God. Sometimes our emotions are heightened. Sometimes our concerns are on high alert. And we want God to do something right now. But he doesn't. He causes us to wait. But God always comes through. And in the end, in reflection, we can see that his timing was absolutely right. Verse 22. Rebecca, we see, is a first-time mother. Even so, she has very good instincts. And she... She recognizes that this, what, what I have in my womb is not normal. There's turmoil happening in my womb. Yes, it's twins, but it's even worse than being twins. She is unsettled. And that's why she says in verse 22, If it be so, why am I thus? She, she's asking the question, Isaac, you think pregnancy is a picnic? Take a look at this. Look at what's happening inside of me. These two are fighting. And indeed, they were. Then we come to verse 23. Verse 23 helps us with that age-old psychological question. What is it that shapes a child's personality? Is it nature? The way he or she is born, everything pre-programmed in the DNA so that right from birth they have their personality set. So is it nature or is it nurture? Is it the way that they are raised? Is that what has the effect that, that develops his or her personality? Well, if we look at verse 23, we have to conclude that nature is at least part of it. For before Esau and Jacob are born, they're already fighting with each other in the womb. So much so that God gives the interpretation. They're going to be two different nations. 
nations that will always be at one another's throat. But nurture has something to do with it too. For if we continue to the next verse, verse 28, which we haven't read yet, this is what we find. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. <laughs> now that's nurture, isn't it? Nurture of the worst kind, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Isaac loved Esau, Rebekah loved Jacob. So Esau and Jacob are born, and we read about that in verses 25 to 27. They're twins, not identical twins. They could not be more different, the two of them. Esau is red and hairy. His name Esau means hairy. His nickname Edom, which became the name of the country that descended from him, that nickname Edom means red. And you see that in verse 30. Jacob, well, he's the exact opposite. He is fair. Esau is an outdoors man. He is a hunter. Jacob, he's an indoors man. He is a chef. Esau is daddy's boy. Jacob, he's mommy's boy. Now these boys are born. Let's have a look at the parenting skills. <laughs> like I said, today is negative. We're looking at the don'ts. Let's not be like Isaac and, and like Rebecca in their parenting skills that we're going to look at today. Next week, we'll balance things out. We'll see some positives from them. But, but three negatives that we do not want to emulate. We, we want to learn from their mistakes. Mistake number one, don't be at odds with your spouse. Don't be at odd with your, odds with your spouse. Mistake number two, don't teach your child to lie. Don't teach your child to lie. And then mistake number three, don't value your child on the basis of performance. Don't value your child on the basis of performance. And this applies to grandparents as well. So let's start with the first one. Don't be at odds with your spouse. Again, verse 28, we've already read it, but let's have a look at it again. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, and, J and Rebekah loved Jacob. <laughs> the rivalry started in the womb with these two boys, and it extended to their parents. Isaac favored Esau, and Rebekah favored Jacob. Isaac should have known better. In fact, he did know better. He deliberately went against what he knew. Before these boys were born, God had revealed that the older would serve the younger. We read about that, didn't we? The older will serve the younger. And so Isaac knew that Esau would not be the superior one, the chosen one. Now that's not to say that he's rejected by God, but Jacob is the one that the promise is, is, is going to flow through. Now, I'm not suggesting that Isaac should have neglected Esau. Uh, that's not the case. But he should not have played favorites with his children. And he definitely should not have showed favoritism to Esau, knowing that Jacob is the one that God has selected for the promise. Now, Rebekah is no better, because she favors Jacob to the exclusion of Esau. They're not in agreement, the two parents. They could not present a united front before the children. They were competitive parents, not cooperative parents. Competitive, not cooperative. We need cooperative parents. We need cooperative grandparents. Todd and Sue were a young couple showing lots of promise. God blessed them with two beautiful children. They were involved in church, serving faithfully there at the services, involved in children's ministry and in music ministry, different things. But Todd and Sue were competitive. They were competitive. One, one day on an impulse, Todd went out and he bought himself a new motorcycle. And Sue, seeing what he did on credit, went and took some credit and she bought herself a new dining room set. And then Todd, seeing what she did, he went out 
and he joined a gym and committed himself financially to that. And then she, seeing what he did and being competitive, she went and she joined a different gym. And back and forth it went, competitive parents. Well, you won't be surprised to know that the rest of the story is that they soon ended up in divorce court. And their two children, torn in the middle. Don't be at odds with your spouse. The best gift that you can give to your children is to love your spouse, to, to be one with your spouse. That gives children security. Well, Isaac and Rebecca did not get divorced, but they did live separate lives. We skip ahead to chapter 27, and in chapter 27, Isaac is now very old and he's blind, and his wife takes advantage of his disabilities to get what she wants for Jacob. Chapter 27, verse 6. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat, that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock, and fetch me from thence two good kids, kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. And so the scheme is birthed. This is competition of the worst sort. Rebecca is involving her son against her other son. She's competing with Isaac. And what's worse, she's cheating in order to win. That's not the way for parents to behave. But sadly, many parents and grandparents live out this negative existence today. They might be together in the same house, but their ambitions and their attitudes are miles apart. And it has an effect, a negative effect, on the children or the grandchildren. And so let's give to our children, our grandchildren, the very best gift, the foundational gift, the gift of a united love, an enduring love for one another and for them. A love that is patient and kind, that does not envy and is not puffed up, that does not behave rudely and does not seek its own, but instead a love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Sadly, this is not a love that Isaac and Rebecca shared. We come now to the second don't. Don't teach your child to lie. Don't teach your child to lie. A mother was taking her son on a train trip. Now the cost for six-year-olds was a certain amount of money, but the cost for a five-year-old was free. So five and under was free. The boy's six years old, but he could pass for five, and so the mother says as they're walking up to the gate, tell him you're five. And so the boy does as the, the mother instructs, but then once on the train and they're on their trip, the conductor comes along and he's checking people's tickets. And he sits down beside the boy and the boy says, I don't have a ticket. And he says, oh, that's interesting. Uh, tell me, when will you turn six? And the boy replied to the conductor, I would say as soon as I get off this train. <laughs> that mother was teaching her son to lie, and that is not doing him a favor. Well, that's what happens with Isaac and Rebecca. They teach their two sons to lie. They do that with their example. Look at Genesis 26. Genesis 26, this is verses 1 to 7. This is going to sound familiar. Different cast of characters, same plot. Genesis 26, verse 1. And there was a famine in the land, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. 
And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto, these, unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice, and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar, in the land of the Philistines. And the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She's my sister. For he feared to say, She is my wife, lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. She's my sister. <laughs> we heard that from Abraham. Two times, in Egypt and in this same location, Gerar. Two times. And it went badly for Abraham. Isaac knew about that. And if that wasn't enough, God has told him directly that he will protect him, he'll take care of him, and he will fulfill the promise. But Isaac's not being a man of faith. Instead, he takes matters into his own hands, and he lies. And his two boys... Esau and Jacob heard it. And they picked it up. Like father, like son. We skip ahead to Genesis 27. Now it's Jacob's turn. Jacob, in verse 11, we pick it up. And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau my brother is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My father peradventure will fill me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver. And I shall bring a curse upon me, and not a blessing. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice, and go fetch me them. And he went and fetched and brought them to his mother. That's the, the two kids that she had spoke about earlier. And his mother made savory meat, just as his father loved. And Rebekah took goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck, so he'd feel rough like Esau. And she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. And he came unto his father, who remember is blind and, and he can't hear very well. And Jacob said unto his father, he, he came unto his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that my soul, that thy soul, may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. He's a bit suspicious. And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him, and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy as his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Oh, the deceit. Oh, the cunning. The outright lies. But Jacob had seen it before. He had seen it in his father. And his father now is falling victim to the same techniques that he himself practiced. The tragedy about all of this is it was entirely unnecessary. Who is it in chapter 25 that said the older would serve the younger? It was God who said that. Who was it that said that the promise would go through Jacob? It was God who said that. Did God need a lie to help him keep his word? Certainly he did not. But because Jacob chose this course along with his mother, Rebekah, all sorts of issues were created. 
Number one, Esau plotted to murder his brother. Number two, as a result, Jacob had to run for his life. Number three, Jacob never saw his mother alive again. What a heartbreak that would have been. Number four, Jacob was himself deceived by his uncle. And number five, Jacob had to watch his back the rest of his life. Why? Because he lied. Don't teach your children or your grandchildren to lie. Teach them to tell the truth and model truth-telling before them. Mark Twain said that the difference between one who tells the truth and one who lies is that the liar better have a better memory. And that's the truth, isn't it? So let's tell the truth. Tell the truth and we'll have no tracks to cover. We come now to the third don't. Don't value your child on the basis of performance. Don't value your child on the basis of performance. Oh, this is an important one. There are so many parents who value their children because of what they do. Now, it can take various forms. There's the parent who values his child as the means to inflate his or her own ego. And grandparents can be the same way. And so they push that child to, to do an engineering degree or to, or to be a doctor or, or to be some kind of thing like that that they then can brag about them or they push them to be a star athlete or, or a, a performing artist. And the child may have some talent, but it may not always be what the child feels comfortable doing. But they're pushed and they're pushed and they're pushed. I've seen this. I've seen parents that they send their children to a private school and then as soon as the school day is over, those kids go to tutoring and then the weekend comes along and all day Saturday, they're in tutoring as well. They're doing school 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Why? So that the parent has something to brag about. That's, that's a love if proposition. I only love you if you get good marks. If you come back with a B, that's not good enough. You're going to have to work harder. And a child feels rejected. What an awful thing. What an awful thing to, to suggest to our children that their performance is a basis upon which we accept and we love them. Well, that's one side of it. Uh, another example of this kind of thing is, is the parent who's lazy and is just demanding their child to, to wait on him or her. Give me, give me a packet of chips. Go take out the dog. Clean up after the dog. Now, I, I'm not talking about chores. It's good, reasonable, right, healthy. It's great parenting and grandparenting to give children some responsibility and help them to learn that. But what I'm talking about is that lazy parent who's just treating the child like a slave. They only exist for what they can do for the parent. That too is self-gratification and it is a horrible way to develop a child. Isaac and Rebecca, they valued their sons on the basis of performance. We're in chapter 27, verse 6. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat, that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord before my death. That's, J that's Isaac, who values Esau for what Esau can do for him. Give him savory game. Now here's Rebekah. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Rebecca is also using Jacob. Poor role models. Let me give you the best role model in contrast. Follow this one. The love of Jesus Christ. The love of Jesus Christ is an unconditional love. It is a, a love that is so sweet. It is affirming. 
It is delivering. It is empowering. What a wonderful love from our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's show that kind of love to our children and our grandchildren. A parent or a grandparent who loves unconditionally as Christ loved unconditionally is always motivated by what is best for the child. Sometimes what is best is not what the child wants. For example, the child may not want to be immunized. Who, who does? <laughs> who wants a needle? But for the health of the child, that's the best thing. Or sometimes a child will say, I don't want to go to church, or I don't want to go to Sunday school. But Sunday school and church is, is, is so important for the child to have that opportunity to trust Christ for salvation and to follow the Lord their God, to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and their neighbor as themselves, and so fulfill their purpose in life. That's what's in the best interest of the child. Is it in the best interest of a child to be converted to Jesus Christ, to be saved from his or her sin? Of course it is. Is it in the best interest of a child to, to learn God's word and to practice prayer and to be obedient? Is it in the best interest of a child to learn to be content in whatever circumstance he or she is in? Is it in the best interest of a child to be a loving person who is giving to other people? Of course it is. And yet how rare are these qualities in our society today? And the reason they're rare is because parents and grandparents are not taking their responsibility seriously. They've become selfish. They, some of them, the most despicable ones, use the children. Or I should say, the most despicable ones abuse the children. Let's not be like them. Let's be like Jesus Christ. Will it be convenient? No, it won't be convenient. Will it require sacrifice? Yes, it will require sacrifice. But don't think of it as a loss. Think of it as an investment. An investment that, as we build into the life of our children and our grandchildren, will return 30, 60, 100 fold in the life to come for the glory of God, not for the glory of us. Well, we've learned some lessons from Isaac and Rebecca in a negative way today. Some don'ts. Let's not do these things. But hang on, because next week we'll see that Isaac and Rebecca are not all bad. They actually are typical. They're like you and me. We are all imperfect. There are, all, there, there are things that all of us could have done better or can do better. <laughs> Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his intervention. God consistently makes up for our weaknesses, our foolishness, and, and God can overcome just as he did for Isaac and Rebecca. So let's have this hope within us. God has promised. He is faithful to his promise. His promise may not come true as quickly as you or I would like it to, but it will come true at exactly the moment it is supposed to. And the timing we will see is perfect. And in the meantime, let's do the best that we can to be a role model of Jesus Christ, to love our children, our grandchildren, and to do what is best for them. Our Father, we pray for your help in this. There are times when we fail, just like Isaac and Rebecca failed. But Lord, you can succeed and we pray you will do that we pray for our children our grandchildren our great-grandchildren that they might know you that they might follow you and that they might have the fulfilling life that always results from being a child of God and the joyful expectation of knowing 
that we will live with you for eternity. We pray all of this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today. May the Lord guide and empower you in the week ahead. May you be a good example, and may you be loving as the Lord loved you. God bless.